Welcome to Rough Drafts, how God writes his love in our stories, a podcast that explores the faith journeys of our friends and neighbors in Burns, Tennessee. Everyone has a story to tell. And in this podcast, we'll hear powerful and inspiring stories of how God works in the ordinary lives of people like you and me. Our stories are unfinished and perfectly imperfect. They are just rough drafts, a glimpse of what is to come because God is still at work, writing plot twists, introducing new characters, and bringing good even from the most challenging circumstances. Join us as we see what God is up to in our stories. Here's your host, Matthew Hyatt. Today's guest is someone who wears more confusing hats than any person I have ever met. Because when you think about people's stereotypes, I mean, there are just certain boxes people fit in, and some boxes don't fit in other boxes. You know, when I think about an old farmer, I don't think about an IT guy. Like, those two things just don't go together. And to get today's guest, uh, well, he goes in all those boxes. He is a singer-songwriter and a photographer, so a visual artist and and, uh, an audio artist. He's a law enforcement officer, uh, and he's an incredible Bible class teacher. Today's guest is Wes Boker. Welcome, Wes. Thanks. I appreciate you uh, asking me to come here, and um, was worried that I wouldn't have a story to tell, but the more I thought about it, preparing for this, I'm like, oh, well, maybe we will have something to talk about. <laughs> well, I've never met a person who doesn't have a story to tell, Right. Yeah. and the few of your stories that I know... You've got some stories to tell. Yeah. And on the way here to record, before we hit the record button, um, I was telling you that I was driving from Dixon to Burns, and I looked over, and in the car next to me, there was a monkey in the passenger seat. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> what did you say when I told you that? Uh, stranger things have happened, and there have been times where I would have settled for a monkey. <laughs> Settling for a monkey may have to be the name of this episode. Yeah. <laughs> so Some weird stuff that well, you see. Wes, I have no clue where you want to start, but what's what's your God story? Well, you know, when you mention that, you know, that it would be about a God story, in my mind, I immediately start trying to think of this one instance where God did this thing. And surely there are those, but I can't help but think just the nature of my story that the whole thing is God's story. Like it's, there's not one aha moment for me, really. It's like... um a recognition in retrospect, looking back, of seeing where God has been very active and very um, involved in the direction of my life and whether or not I was alive or not and, you know, from the very beginning. So I don't know how far back you want me to go, but uh, it really starts at birth for me, honestly. I don't think it usually starts much before this. Sure, yeah. Well, um, a lot of people have heard this story, and I apologize for those of you who already have, but um, when I was born, way back in the 1980s, I was uh, born with two kidneys that neither of them worked, and um, so I don't remember any of this. Keep in mind, all of this happens before I was nine months old, so uh, I kind of joke sometimes. I remember the first time, early 2000s, I saw Harry Potter, and uh, they talk about him as the boy who lived and, and they recognize him by the scar that he has. And I, that resonated so much with me because, um, a lot of things that I knew about myself early on was people referring to me basically as the kid who lived through that thing and has the scars to show for it. So born with, you know, two kidneys that weren't uh, working. Uh, the doctor at the time said that I had pneumonia and, uh, so they, began treating me for that, and turns out it wasn't pneumonia, it was failing kidneys, and I couldn't breathe and things like that, so... And breathing is fairly important. Yeah. That's what I understand. Um, so, and keep in mind, I'm telling this from stories that have been told to me, so, um, they wind up running tests or whatever and find out, no, his kidneys are failing, so... Which is an issue, because I'm an infant. I I was just born, and up to that point, kidney transplants were really only done on older uh, people. And so the idea that they would even attempt that was a bit of a risk uh, that it would not work. So uh, so over the next nine months and 
after what I've been told is, you know, 13, 12 or 13 operations to do who knows what, um, I had a kidney transplant. And at that time in 1986 or seven, or I guess 87 was when that happened. Um, I was the youngest to successfully receive a kidney transplant. It made the cover of the Tennessee and all this. And, and so, you know, of course, the one kidney that I have to this day is one of my father's kidneys. Um, he, both he and my mother were candidates for donating a kidney to me. Um, but I guess they came to the agreement that the better plan was that he give up a kidney for me and she be prepared to take care of both of us if, you know, however the need arose. So that's basically how it went. And, um, I'm sitting here today, uh, talking to you. I am no longer on dialysis or anything like that and, uh, haven't been in since I was an infant. So I, I don't remember any of that, have no, no issues and, um, have lived quite the spectacular life whenever doctors um, said maybe things were going to go otherwise. I mean, that's a story. Yeah. So I did your dad ever be like, you know, you don't get anything for your birthday. I already gave you a kidney. Well, that you know, that was kind of, <clears throat> you know, as kids, all of us, we get to a point early on when we all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, the world existed before I was born. That's weird. And so that kind of drove it home for me is like, I'm starting to hear these stories from, from people. And, you know, back then you didn't have GoFundMes and, and all that stuff. So people that I will never know, uh, family and other people invested, you know, would stand out in intersections of, of traffic to collect money, to pay for, you know, my, my things that were being done. And, and I, I'm forever grateful for everyone who was invested in in how things were going for me. And um, so with all of that being said, as early as I can remember in childhood, I've been very vividly aware of my own mortality. I've, I've seen every day as, hey, this is a gift. Like, you weren't supposed to necessarily survive uh, your first year of life. And it's weird for me to think that you know, up until then, um, other babies in my situation probably didn't make it. But because someone said, what if we try this and it worked, you know, I've, I've gone on to enjoy the life that I have. Do you have a memory of learning this or was this something you always knew? I don't remember specifically, um, like a moment where that news was given to me, it was just always part of, of who I understand it, who under, who I understood my, um, my background to be. And I think my grandmother kind of kept a little memoir, uh, throughout the experience and I've read it. So there are some details there as far as how the family was receiving all of this news as they were being hit with it and, and, and how people, you know, really came, stepped up and, and supported my mom and dad uh, through such a traumatic thing that I, you know, as as someone who is a dad of my own three boys now, I, I just can't imagine what my mom and dad uh, went through emotionally and all that. Especially, like you said, in the, the time period where they did this, where you don't have GoFundMe, they can't go on Google and find the pictures of cute kids who have survived this like mm. they're blazing a new trail for you and yeah. that's that's something yeah it's it's pretty wild i mean for a long time uh, i would go up to i you know i go to vanderbilt it's where the transplant was done and i've gone once a year ever since and there are people who remember that they're like oh you're you're wes you're that that kid that that this worked on and so again being told things about myself these traumatic things that i don't have any memory of, but I have the scars, you know, my upper torso is very, you know, uh, surgical technology has advanced since then. And, you know, I've seen people have similar procedures where they have no scarring, but, you know, I've got very obvious scarring, uh, around my whole torso and, and they, you know, I, I like to 
make up stories people ask you know uh man what happened it was grizzly bear attack and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> so, well you see there was this orphanage fire right yeah you know. well i mean the thing is though with your uh your line of work whatever story you came up with is pretty uh pretty believable yeah. and if this is too blunt forgive me but you talked about your childhood you were vividly aware of your mortality mm-hmm. Fast forward to adulthood, and you are in a profession that forces you to be vividly aware yeah. of mortality. So, um, I mean, you've told me one God story, but I, I suspect there's some more. Yeah. Um, I mean, that sort of is the building blocks because not only am I aware of how precious life is, but it's the gift of my parents' sacrifice to me to make that happen and for my dad to go under a knife and give up part of himself so that I could live like that preaches Mm -hmm. to a small child who hasn't can't even you know um, write yet and things like that and so just this idea of living sacrificially has just always been very real to me because of that picture that I had to to learn it from and so I think like I said I I haven't recognized some of this stuff until I've looked back Uh, I didn't necessarily have a childhood dream to be a police officer, but then I look and I'm like, wait a minute. So many people have given up so much so that I could be here. Like, doesn't it make sense that I would be drawn to a career path that would allow me to give up things so that other people might have, you know, freedom from abuse and freedom from whatever it is they're going through. Yeah. So... I mean, I see how that's connected and how that would drive you. Um, I also see how there's a world where that background could be a burden for you rather than a motivation for you. Uh, has that ever been the case? or mm, Not really. I mean, of course, when I was a kid, you know, you go to pool parties and the kids are like, what's wrong with you? And all, because, you know, I, I didn't look normal in my, in my bathing suit. Um, but, you know, you try to tell people, you know, I went through this surgery and you know, that's what happened. It wasn't until later I figured out, hey, let's have fun with this and start making up stories. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's funny talking about uh, building blocks. I, I came across an old photo of myself. I think I'm four, and judging from the photograph. It's Christmas, I think, because there's gifts behind me. I don't know, some type of a holiday. And... Uh, I'm on a bicycle, and behind me is a police officer costume, like brand new, and a little toy guitar sitting behind me. And I'm like, what in the world? Like, that's that sums up, like, so much of the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> like, right there when I'm four. <laughs> so Yeah, it's almost prophetic or yeah, something. Yeah, it's weird. So, um, yeah, but I think, you know, I couldn't speak enough about living with a gratitude of just being alive and you know when I was little I'd go to like kidney camps and you might think well what's a kidney camp well it's just you know it's kind of like a bible camp but it's comprised of other kids who have gone through similar things or going through them or about to and uh, so here I am like seven eight years old at this camp and I'm around kids my age that are on dialysis and and that are much much worse off than than I was and it to the degree that I felt like I didn't belong there because outwardly I'm as able and um, apparently healthy as any average kid and um, while they're you know having to break away from the ball game to go do their dialysis and things like that and just being around that at such a young age and recognizing that other people like everybody is going through life a different way and experiencing life a different way really gave me some super early perspective of the world doesn't revolve around me and um, everybody has something they're trying to work through. Fair. Let's let's move forward to the present day a little bit um, because I'm sure this is one of the areas where just people are going to have questions. What what has been your experience as a person of faith Mm -hmm. in law enforcement, which is a hard job on yeah. the best of days. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I don't remember who said it, but I've heard uh, some people say um, 
that you can't be a Christian and be a police officer. Like that's speaking the broad brush. Yeah, it is. Um, and I don't know, I, I guess that maybe has something to do with a person's perception of what a police officer is. Uh, but, and it's true. Uh, you are in, you're surrounded by darkness, uh, all the time. And even early on, um, you know, I've, Mostly everybody, the new hires start off on night shift. So not only are you in literal darkness because you're working midnights, uh, but you are dealing with people at their worst times in their life. And you're having these close calls with death yourself because of, um, you know, situations that you're put into. All these situations where everyone else would would not want to get involved. It is your job to get involved and to go towards the threat or go towards the uh whatever the situation is. So yes, I can entirely see and that it is difficult and I fell victim to it early on as well, that that becomes your whole like perception of the world. Um, so I'm early on, I'm on midnights and, uh, you know, I know we're skipping forward quite a bit, but I, I hadn't, I kind of fell off in, in, so I go back up a little bit. I go to Freed Hardman uh, for one year because I want to be a youth minister and left just because I was like, man, I can't, can't afford this. I don't want to ask my parents to take other loans out for me and things like that. So at this point, your dad couldn't sell a kidney. Right. Yeah. No more kidneys to spare. So come back, you know, try to get some jobs around, you know, Jackson and things like that. But uh, wind up getting a job as a 911 operator here in Dixon. And I did that job for several years and um, wound up thinking, hey, I don't necessarily want to, you know, I'm in my early 20s, do I want to be in a basement in a chair on a phone for the foreseeable future? Not that there's anything wrong with that at all, but, you know, I'm just like, what else can I do? How else can I contribute? So I went to the chief of that time. I was like, hey, I, I think I'd like to go on patrol. And so um, eventually get hired and all that and get thrown on night shift, get thrown into the whole law enforcement culture and um, and get surrounded by just this. Everyone you meet isn't a great person, everyone you're surrounded with. And, you know, are there Christian police officers? For sure there are. Uh, police officers, and we can go into this whole bit about what is a police officer. A police officer is a human like everybody else. I mean, I shouldn't even have to say that, but it seems like it should be fairly obvious. It, but if you read social media, you tend to think that they're either all thugs or they're all saviors. Yeah. It's kind of black or white. Yeah. And as somebody who's been in it for almost coming up on 20 years now, it, it, both are true. And every officer has to decide which one of those he wants to be. And so early on, you know, here I am living on my own apart from my parents who, you know, I'm not surrounded by Christian influences, you know, church going folks. And you know, there is, there, there are all kinds of different ways that the misery of, of the job tends to be medicated, uh, in that community. And, you know, I, I would try to go to church. I was going to Walnut street at that time and I would show up in the morning after getting off shift and, uh, no offense to the preacher at the time, but I would be sitting up straight asleep in, in the pew because I just, it was taking everything I could out, out of me. So, yeah. um, so it just got, got to where that was my whole world perspective was what I was experiencing at work. And it got worse and darker and a lot of other things uh, going on connected to that. And I just got to a point uh, where, you know, I had a very long-standing relationship that that ended in the most devastating of ways um, and kind of understood that as a person who went to Freed Hardman, as a person who grew up in the church, uh, that I had disconnected from from any source of, of goodness. And it's not even so much 
that I was out doing, doing wrong, but my whole worldview was everybody's liars, everybody's cheats, everybody's all these things that I'm experiencing. And so I started, um, kind of broke down at, at my lowest point and was like, I've got to get connected back into a Christian community. And so I did, I, I went and, um, my grandmother was going to West Dixon, uh, at the time. And so I just threw myself into that wholeheartedly and, and was at that point had made it to second shift, which is the evening shift. So my supervisor was allowing me to go and kind of sit quietly in the back of services on Wednesdays and Sundays if I was working. So I never missed anything. So it's cool that you uh, got to kind of sneak in. Yeah. Um, so just fell in love with the people there and more than anything. And they, they probably never knew, um, how, how much that time of my life I needed to be there because their goodness reminded me that there was light in the world to be seen and to be experienced. And there was love. And, um, this may not be a thing that that's worth even saying, but I, mm-hmm. I kind of feel a, a draw inside to say it. Um, you know, West Dixon's a small church mm-hmm. a struggling yeah. and, and I'm not criticized. There's nothing about that, but I am incredibly grateful for the really good things that a church like that can mm-hmm. still do yeah. and their investment in you. Yeah may be one of the best things that they did in that time period. Right. And that's not to put down anything else they've done. Yeah. Uh, but when I was in college, I worshiped with this church that had about 30 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had like 30 people on Sunday morning. They had 29 people on Sunday night, 29. Yeah. And mm-hmm. everybody knew everybody. And it would be really easy to be critical and say, well, you know, this church isn't sending missionaries. Or, well, they were. Well, this mm-hmm. church, that church was incredible yeah. and the blessing, the investment they made in my life yeah. was so profound. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe I just want to interrupt for a second to say thank you to the small churches of the world who 100%. are doing good things. Absolutely. And I, uh, I think because of the nature of the size of the church, I was able to have a much more intimate and personal rebuilding of my faith in that time of my life than maybe you know, not saying anything bad about Walnut Street, but this, a large congregation where I could just slip in and out and never be noticed. You couldn't sleep through service at West Dixon. Yeah. You, you couldn't. Yeah. Right. So, but that, that was a major turn point for me. And they, they eventually found out that I had an interest in, in youth ministry and they didn't have anyone doing um, anything specific with, with the youth. So they sort of uh, put me over that, so I, I became yeah. I'm I'm now the West Dixon Church of Christ Youth Minister, and and I did that for a while and loved every moment of it. And we'll get to here in a minute the reason why uh, we left there and the reason why I'm no longer the <laughs> the youth minister of of uh, West Dixon, and that is my wife. Um, so the class that I was teaching there was um, I say youth, but it was more anyone under 30 basically um so it was any you know 15 year olds all the way up to you know 30s and if if they were interested in coming so um here i am been in a real dark place kind of lost my faith in in people and i'm in the middle of doing the work to try to just hold myself accountable and to not be molded by the world I was having to live in at work. And, um, and that's one, one, uh, fateful Sunday morning, um, uh, a, a young lady came in to visit, uh, Burns and just happened to visit my class, uh, while she was there. And we now have, uh, an amazing marriage and, uh, three little boys, so. Does Nicole know about this? Yeah, she does. <laughs> so, uh, sure. She had told me, you know, she had been here at, at Burns, and then we eventually, of course, we got married here and and decided, you know, we bought a house close by and just kind of migrated everything over here to Burns, and it's been one of the best decisions, you know. It was cool how West Dixon was a true blessing to both of you individually yeah. in yeah. different ways, but yeah. then the blessing in where it brought you together. Yeah. Um, 
you've heard Peggy's episode yeah. of this show by now. Mm-hmm. And she did tell a little story in there about right. a yeah. young couple right. she knew at the church. Do you happen to know who she was talking I about? I know exactly who she's talking okay. about. Okay. So, yeah, I, I thought you did. No, that, it's just, and that was one of those things where I look back and I tell Nicole all the time, I'm like, you, if, if I could ever point to a moment in my life where God gave me a gift and said, hey, here's for me to you, bud, like it was Nicole. Uh, because you know we just it, it I don't know it, it's just been nothing but the best part of my life um, and you know still in law enforcement and um, and major kudos to her for um, being willing to be married to a police officer because that's no small thing um, she knows as well as I do that every day I go to work you know might be the last and and part of the dark parts of of my work related uh life are, are I've had three friends killed on duty um people I knew people I ate at the Mexican restaurant with and and hung out with you know outside of work and things like that and it's it's a weird thing because most people in their jobs yeah, you you may have a coworker die for this or that reason, but most people don't have their coworkers murdered, right? You know, and that's I remember, you know, the first two had died early on in my patrol career, and I remember uh, a more experienced deputy coming up to me because we had been friends, because you know I'd been around, and he said something to the effect of, "You're not supposed to experience this much at once," basically, like. It was, it was one thing after another, um, you know, it was Andy Wall and then, you know, I wrote a song, uh, for, for that situation called Street Soldier. And one of the last uh, conversations that I had with deputy Keith Beller was about that song that I had written, not knowing that he'd be the next to be killed. Um, and then of course, probably the hardest hitting of all was Daniel Baker, who uh, we kind of came up together, uh, me as a dispatcher, him as, as as a deputy, and you know, been on lots of calls together. He's he's covered me in a lot of tense situations, and and you know, I had gone on to work, left uh, Dixon, and had been at Bell Mead, where I still am, and had gotten a call of what had happened that morning, and. Yeah, you know, I had to leave work that day. I went to the chief. I was like, "Look, I'm not not clear in my head right now because of I'm trying to make sense of all of this." He's like, "You need to just go home." Yeah, you know. And so, uh, Chief Eads, now Sheriff Eads at the time, you know, could see that I was bothered and and had a heart for me. And I I can't say enough good about him. He's been such a blessing to us in the jail chaplaincy too. Mm-hmm. I'm just so impressed with him and and with his wife and um, Kristen has been one of the episodes on this show too hmm. and that's been that's been pretty cool. Cool, that's been pretty cool. So how do you how do you keep the darkness at bay? Hey, well, I think early on because you know I grew up in a household that was wonderful. Like my parents couldn't have been better parents and house full of love, you know, doing normal kid stuff, playing baseball, you know, playing music, all this great stuff. Never, ever knew that right here in Dixon County, the stuff was going on that goes on here until I was in it. You know, I, later on, I had someone come to me uh, and say, hey, man, we think we're moving to, we just moved here to Dixon and, uh, Things are things are great here, aren't they? Something like that. I was like, man, like I don't want to burst anybody's bubble. And I love Dixon. I'm here still as an adult by choice, and you know I'll, I'll probably never leave. Uh, this is my home, but uh, there's stuff that goes on here that no one knows, and it's best. Yeah, you know, I wish I still had that mentality of of um, obliviousness to things. But as far as dealing with the darkness 
I took all of it really personal and hard early on. And, and now both being an experienced officer, being, you know, active at the church and, and having groups of friends now apart from work that, that are spiritually minded and build me up and, and pick me up when I'm not doing great. You know, uh, there's, uh, people here, you know, sometimes I come in to class on Wednesday nights and, and I'll have stuff, something on my shoulder from what I've had to do. I think, you know, one class, you know, I'm sitting right in front of you and I'm like, man, I just had to AED a guy earlier. And as far as I know, he didn't make it, but I mean, that's just like not normal stuff for people to yeah. have to do in their life. You know, most of us walk into church on Wednesday night and our issue was that the copier jammed one too mm-hmm. many times today and you made a death notification yeah. or you pulled someone out of a, of a wreck yeah. or you tried to resuscitate someone or. Yeah. yeah. And it's part of it in large part, honestly, is, is being in Bellmead is, was a culture shock. It's a wonderful place. It's probably the best police job a person can have. I love my coworkers and I'm not just saying that, um, we're all kind of, we're such a small department. You're, you're kind of family and, and I do love that. And we don't in large part deal with the same amount of stuff I was dealing with here in Dixon. So that that's helped too, but we still get some crazy stuff that I've really got to remind myself, Hey, uh, God is in control. You are out here trying to make a positive difference and God is not, uh, somewhere else. He's there with you trying to help you be that, uh, force for good in the world. So there's been plenty of, uh, situations where I've sat in my patrol car after the call was over with my head down telling God that could have been it right there. And, um, coming back to that innate sense of mortality, you know, just always being reminded that um, one day it might be. I hope not. I hope I hope I make it through a career and either retire or, or something like that. But, um, but it was very important for me uh, to be comfortable with that and to be comfortable with knowing that my soul is where it needs to be in relationship with God because of my relationship with God. And regardless of what may happen at work, away from work, going to work, you know, I always joke that I worry all the time about what might happen at work, but, you know, it it might get, you know, something tragic happen on my day off or something like that because that's life. It is funny, though. You know, we, we pay attention to the big, bad, scary threats. Everybody thinks about the, the danger of, of an unhinged, uh, of a shooter. Yeah. And there, that's a real danger, but people forget that the even more real and ever-present danger is the fact you're sitting on the side of a road. Yeah. And I understand that more officers are killed yeah. by automobiles and gunfire. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I would say to that when I, when I refer to darkness in my life, it's, I would say that I would, I have dealt with a level of depression, uh, maybe as part of it, maybe something in early in my childhood. I I don't know. I think, uh, I've had such a complex and weird, um, upbringing, you know, everything I've talked about so far and just trying to make sense of why my life has gone so differently than the average kid and things like that. And, um, and then I get in this place where, you know, I'm surrounded by evil and, and, and wrongdoing and just selfishness and, and all this stuff. And, and it weighs on you. And, and I would say that depression is, of course, everywhere, but hugely an un, uh, 
I don't think we talk about it in, in within law enforcement circles enough because we 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 usually when you hear the words or the letters PTSD, you're talking about army veterans, military people, and for sure, like no doubt, that's very legitimately um, a struggle for them. But I I think the PTSD of a life in law enforcement is often overlooked. And I think there, I do have, you know, probably more than, than I realize. And it's because so much of our job to us is quote, I'm doing air quotes, normal. And really, it's really not like if you, if I go talk to other people, they're like, you did what? Yeah. But if I were to have that same conversation within a circle of police friends, they're like, oh yeah. And that was, that was my day. Yeah. So, I remember when I did a ride along with you, one of the things that was just um, really eye opening to me was how everyone stares at you. Mm -hmm. Like you are constantly being looked at. Yeah. Your presence changes a room, it changes the way people drive. Yeah. I think that would drive me insane is trying to drive to work in a, a car knowing that everyone's now going five under because you're behind them, yeah. even though you're in a different county. Um, but that pressure, that focus. It is very. It is a lot of pressure, and um, you know, from the time that I get in my car, you know, I've got a camera. I've got a camera on my body. I've got people, you know, looking at me wherever I go because, like you said, I'm in a uniform and a marked car, and um, there is there is a lot of of that on you all the time, kind of like you're uh, under surveillance 100 percent of the time. So I, I love. <laughs> when I'm not in uniform and get to kind of just be part of the crowd, it's, it's not something you know that you would appreciate until you've lived, um, with both a target on your back because you don't, and it's something they harp on a lot, like in police academy and stuff. I mean, you could pull somebody over because something as small as they've got a tail light out. Well, that's my perspective. I'm just going to go tell this guy, hey, man, go, go fix your tail light and have a great day. That's my perspective. But his perspective is, I hope he doesn't find the body in the trunk. Yeah. Like, that's how that we used to have back in the day, we'd have terminology like low risk stops and high risk stops. And, and we kind of phased that out. It's, we treat them all as high risk. And I think if people understood like that's why some officers are so intense is because we're going into every single situation, assuming the person wants to kill us. Yeah. That can't be good for your brain. Mm -mm. Even if that's the right thing to do for training, which, right. which I could see, yeah. but I mean, that's not, how do you not end up in some dark, dark places yeah. where when you go to Walmart, you assume that everyone there wants to kill you, yeah. you know? And it's happened. I've, I've had people I've had an incident where, a gentleman, well, I use that term lightly, <laughs> approached me at a this Shell station in Charlotte because I was on my way to visit my parents and uh, I'm paying for gas. And he comes up to me. He's like, hey, man, you ain't so big and bad now, are you? Because I'm just, you know, I'm off. And I just kind of look at him and like, man, you don't, you don't want to start anything. Yeah. But he didn't. <laughs> I don't know if it was the look in my eye or what, but he, he went on his way. But it just, that's, it's like the worst case of being a celebrity that you can think of. All of the downsides and none of the benefits yes, you're, yeah. you're not getting. Yeah. But don't worry, you get 10% off on your coffee occasionally. Oh, uh, maybe. You know, maybe. Um, so you said in the, in the intro to the show that, you know, uh, you would kill for it to be a monkey some days. Yeah. So do you have a story you can tell that's just a fun story? <laughs> well, I got... Or a sad one or a tough one, um, whichever you want to tell. Well, that particular story that you told reminded me of I, we stopped a car one night and there was a it's like a van seems like this has been so long ago i don't remember the exact details but the seats i guess were laid down and they had a, a calf laid down in the back of the car like a baby cow a, a baby cow <laughs> i can't remember why that was but i was like oh i was looking for a gun back there but it was actually a small mammal so <laughs> that's no, kind of amazing yeah, um, no, there's, there's plenty. 
And, and that's the thing about police work, and probably the reason why I'm still in it years later is it's not, it's not all trauma, and it's not all headaches, and it's not all darkness. There are a handful of moments where I'm like, man, like I just saved somebody's life, and that you, you really hang on to those moments to remind you why you wake up at 4 a.m. every morning to put a bulletproof vest on. So. Can you share one of those stories? Um, let's see. Um, there was a time years ago where um, dispatch told me, "Hey, you got a phone call? Can you or can you handle this call over the phone?" I'm like, "Sure." So I pull over into the, uh, I guess it's still the dialysis clinic in in Dixon, right across from Walmart. And so I'm sitting there. It's nighttime. I'm on the phone with this person about like a fraud case or something like that. And as I'm talking to them, and I'm like, got my headlights turned off, and hopefully nobody comes to bother me while I'm handling this case for the phone, all of a sudden here comes this car screeching into the parking lot on two wheels right in front of me, and two women burst out each side of the car screaming and running towards me with a like a three-year-old laying across their arms. And I'm like, ma'am, I, I have to go deal with <laughs> yes so i got off the phone I, i'm trying to let dispatch know what in the world is going on because i have no idea well it turns out he had taken a medication and was having a bad reaction and couldn't breathe oh. and so um i'm thinking I'm, a, I'm about to have to start cpr on him or whatever so i take him in my arms and lay him across the hood of my car because it's all i have to work with and he he is breathing he, he's he's breathing kind of in a labored way but so i get on I'm trying to like watch him and talk to dispatch at the same time, like, you know, get me EMTs or whatever. So they show up the first, the, uh, fire department shows up and, uh, I don't remember which firefighter it was, but he looked at the kid and basically, I don't know how, if some people don't know how this normally works when you call for medical assistance, generally the fire department, they're like a medical first response as well, because they're medically trained and they will show up and kind of try to stabilize things while we wait for the EMTs to show up, like the ambulance. And so firefighter gets out, looks at the kid, and is like, like, we've got to go. Like, is there anything in your passenger seat? I was like, there's about to not be. So yeah. I grab all my stuff, throw it in the back. He takes the kid in his arms, jumps in my passenger seat, and like, let's go. So I do who knows what from there to uh, the Horizon ER. And it was a pretty traumatic night there. I stayed with them, uh, but they saved him. And oh wow, you know, it was just I was I was the ambulance driver for a minute, and and you know, that was that was one of those moments where, and I think his grandmother uh, contacted me a, a little while later, like, "Thank you for saving his life." And I was, like, man, this is it's just not a thing that you planned for, and it just kind of fell in my lap. And, those moments undo some of the, we pay your salary, yeah. why are you eating donuts? Yeah. You know. Yeah. There's, I probably shouldn't say this, but especially in Bellmead, there are days where I'm like, man, I can't believe they're paying me what they pay me to do this job. <laughs> and then there are other days where I'm like, man, I can't believe they're only paying me what they're paying me to do this job. <laughs> so it goes both ways. Absolutely. And so I don't complain. I'm, I'm grateful to have a job, um, you know, especially to have had constant income throughout the pandemic and all that. And that was a whole, whole weird thing for all of us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it's allowed me to grow a family and allow my wife to stay home and homeschool our boys. And, you know, I just, would I rather be, you know, doing songwriting stuff? I don't know, maybe, but part of me wonders if I were doing that, if I would feel as fulfilled um, as far as contributing to society as, as an officer compared to if I were holed up in a room somewhere writing songs for people, I don't know. I mean, there is no doubt that when you go home from work, you made a difference. And you said earlier that when you're with people, um, it's it is never the best day of their life. And it's almost always the worst day of it, whether yeah. they were in a car accident or they got a speeding ticket or they're running from the law, whatever it is, yeah. they're having a bad day. Yeah. And for you, that's normal. Yeah. And being a non-anxious presence 
Um, I saw a video on the news of you recently, mm -hmm. and that sentence is generally a sentence that strikes terror <laughs> into, to most people's hearts. But uh, there was a, a lady who's being arrested in Belmede who is being separated from her child. She mm -hmm. needed to be. Mm -hmm. And what was so neat about you in that video um, was mom is hysterical. Mm -hmm. You know, what's happening to my baby? What's happening to my baby? What's happening? Well, you shouldn't have been driving drunk with your baby, yeah. you know, but a legitimate concern. Yeah. And the way that you were able to, I don't remember your exact words, but you basically said, ma'am, you're going to jail today, yeah. but we're going to take care of your child yeah. and we're going to make sure your kid's safe. And then the things that you did, uh, I think you had a, a stuffed animal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I keep a bag of stuffed animals in, in my trunk and that's really come into uh, a lot of use over the years just because, you know, I I don't want a child's first experience with law enforcement to be a traumatic one because 100% of the time I'd say it's not the child's fault mm -hmm. that police have had to show up in their lives. Um, and that's a thing, too, that, man, I see uh, an opportunity for me to get on a soapbox for things, but, you know, I I love kids, have my own, I treat the children that I deal with at work. You know, I'm, as far as I know, basically um, the guy in Davidson County for uh, child seat installations and things like that, um, and I do it because I want to, and I love knowing the little ones are being taken care of, but uh, there are a few things that bother a police officer as much as when parents use us as a threat of discipline mm -hmm. on their children. Yeah, that's just dumb. Yeah, it happens a lot. And if you don't act up, I'll call the police. Yeah, and there's two reasons why. First is um, you're already setting up a negative premise for who we are and what we do. Like they're, those guys are the punishers. Those guys are the... Uh, you better not get on their bad side type of thing. Not, hey, those, that, 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 that guy's a dad with a badge mm -hmm. who loves kids. Um, and the second thing is, if you tell, if you let your kids know that you need to resort to the police to handle the situation, you're telling them it's beyond you. Like, you, you, you have now given up control of your kids. Yeah. Which... I've seen, you know, we, we, a lot of times are called into situations where we basically have to, uh, get involved because parenting hasn't been done for 18 years or seven, you know, 15 years. And, and we have to kind of step in and be the parent in a, in a weird way. Mm. And a lot of heartbreak, a lot of things that, that you have to see in any, uh, first responder type of role, um, where, kids are living in uh, not great situations and there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, there's been a couple of instances where I was like, man, if I could just adopt that, that child, like it, I could, they'd be in such a better place, but it was just, that was not even an option. And so, you know, at the end of the day, all this good stories and bad stories, uh, and whether you're in law enforcement or whatever your job is like you get to choose how you react to it and you get to choose what authority it has over your spiritual life and for me it took some time because I wasn't intentionally um, taking measures to rebalance myself but um, you know I am um uh, very grateful that there have been people and opportunities in my life that have reminded me to take care of my soul first and then let whatever job I'm doing flow out from that. So where does songwriting play into all this? Oh man, that's a... Uh, where does Artistic West come in? Yeah, I think... I mean, Nicole is a, a painter and does a lot of things, yeah. but... Uh, it's... Well, I was born into a very musical family. Uh everybody grandmother was in uh, and her brother and sister were in a pretty successful uh band 
throughout and they've been singing and then my dad's a songwriter um so as early as I can remember I remember dad trying to teach me how to play guitar when I was like seven or something and um I got frustrated and I remember telling him I'm never playing guitar again because I was just frustrated and I couldn't figure it out and that didn't last too long uh so just always had was drawn to to music and and to doing uh musical stuff and then of course seeing my dad write his own songs I'm like that's a thing I guess songs come from somewhere (laughs) I didn't realize like just a person sits down and makes something up and so I started trying and um, have been trying ever since and so I've been doing that on the side uh, from the police work and there have been opportunities I've had when I've performed in my police uh, uniform and things like that. I remember I did some type of community event in Dixon uh, years ago, and I got up and I sang like one song, and it was while I was on duty, and it was approved by you know the chief and, and things. And a couple months later, I go to a call where I'm helping like one of the business owners of the small of a small business here in Dixon, and she comes out. She's like, "Wait a minute." You're the singing officer. <laughs> I was like, the singing officer. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I, I guess so. Yes, how important is that? I mean, because, um, again, we've talked a lot on the show about stereotypes and images. Mm-hmm. Uh, people have a stereotype of a police officer. Yeah. But when you got up and sang in the uniform, mm-hmm. you broke that and you yeah. became a real human being yeah. again. And, that's, and I love that. And how that's important what, that is. Man, I, I just didn't. A lot of things happen. Anytime anybody gets a new job where you're working with the public and and you get treated poorly by the public and, you know, it changes the way you, you see, you know, servers at restaurants and things like, oh, wait a minute, this person's getting treated like trash all day long. You know how I know that? Because I am. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then you see things in the news. You know, that, that's one different thing is, is officers are so often portrayed as just this evil force I guess the stormtroopers yeah and you know maybe sometimes that's true I'm not going to try to say that we're all good and great but more often than not we're just uh, normal people trying to provide for our families and um, and so the songwriting has helped uh, humanize uh, the badge stuff and um, and also help me get a lot of that dark uh, stuff out of me in the form of you know just like journaling does I mean it's just a form of journaling melodically really it's processing yeah. and if you don't process I mean if you heard Greer's show a few weeks ago you heard how important it is to be able to work through the mm-hmm. things that we're dealing with instead of just pretend like they're not there yeah so, you know, I, it may be that nothing ever comes of, of the songwriting, but um, it's helped me, if nothing else. And and I've had other officers come to me, especially the song that I wrote in the wake of Trooper Wall's death. And that was me trying to process, like, oh, not only did your friend just die, but he died because he's in an occupation that you also are in. <laughs> and so it was a lot of weight hitting you all at once and then and so yeah it's trying to make sense of things and and maybe take something negative and create something positive with it is there a story you haven't gotten a chance to tell today that you'd like to oh man Th- that's the problem there's so many stories and, and you're taught early on like in police academy like you are going to deal with tens to hundreds of people like a month or a week and they're just going to become like another face to you you don't mean anything by it but each one of those people that you come into contact with you're probably the first officer that they've either dealt with in a long time or they've dealt with this week your presence in their life is going to be way more impactful than theirs is for you and so i say that because there are tons of stories that I could, I could tell but I don't 
like a lot of it's just a blur and yeah. maybe it comes up something reminds me but um man it's not really uh, not not one specifically there's just i've got thousands of stories swimming around in my yeah. head right now so well you have a song that just came out yeah um tell us about that yeah so it's called master of the storm and it's kind of very much dealing with what I would call depression in, in my life. And I, I don't know. It's, it's, I felt like a lot of the encouraging music and Christian music that I've listened to, a lot of it was just very like, you know, praise God, things are great, you know, and a Christian knows things are very often not great. Um, there are plenty of, of David's Psalms where he's talking about, God, I, I don't see a way out of this and, you know, have mercy on the things that I've done and, and just not flowery, uh, sunshiny imagery. And so well, 40% of the book of Psalms is in that category of lament. Yeah. And if you look at our hymnals, less than really less than one or 2% is anywhere close. Yeah. Um, so you've given us almost a lament. Yeah. Well, and there's that, and I was writing it at the time we were going through that uh, Unseen Realm series here. And so just this idea, you know, you had used the imagery of, like, being a fish in a fishbowl, and, like, you don't see the world outside the fishbowl. And so the lyrics on into, like, the chorus is, like, I forget that you, being God, can see it all. And it seems like any time that I get weighed down by work or life or whatever it's because I'm only seeing like my little my little piece of that puzzle but God sees how that moment affects the future and and things like that because you know I went I wound up at West Dixon Church of Christ because I was in a bad place and needed to be restored spiritually I had no idea I would meet my wife there later and that we would have three boys and all these things. And uh, so God turned uh, a dark situation into the best time of my life. And Master of the Storm kind of acknowledges that, you know, life, especially 2020 on in the world, has been weird and challenging and doesn't seem like it's going to be getting any better anytime soon. And just for me and anyone else listen to the song to remember the news is going to tell you this story or that story but god knows the whole story and to kind of lean more into that and that's good would it be all right if we shared the song with our listeners oh, or, absolutely or where and where can they find the rest of your music um well probably right now the best is just search my name on youtube i'm okay. a youtube channel so or tiktok or whatever Plant my feet in hard times Mercy falls like rain Faithfulness like sunshine Let me grow from pain God, I cannot see From my view, clouds are closing in mind. Only hope is you, and I forget that you can see it all. My creator, lift me when I cross.
Wes, thanks for uh, thanks for the gift of your time, and thanks for uh, leaving our friends today with a gift of your music too. Absolutely. That's really cool. And this has been an awesome opportunity to vent some things out because people don't really um, they see the guy, and you know, officers are often you know unemotional. You know, we're kind of trained to not get too emotional about stuff, so a lot of times we seem like you know, statues of people, but there's a whole story going on inside. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, friends, thanks for listening today. Wes, thank you for, for sharing this beautiful music, for sharing your beautiful story, um, and for encouraging us to uh, uh, be vividly aware of our mortality yeah. and vividly aware of the life we have in Christ and for being intentional about fighting the darkness that creeps in uh, each and every day. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope that you'll join us again next week uh, for the next time we get to hear one of these stories. Until then, I can't wait to hear what God's up to in your story. Thanks for listening to Rough Drafts. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, help us spread the word by leaving a rating and review. Until next time, Let's keep looking for how God writes his love into our stories.